This time, we're taking a look at the dystopian modern classic, Children of Men. And along the way, we find out that American Sniper wasn't the first film to have a fake baby, that 2027 is looking pretty bleak, and that Clive Owen may have made a decent James Buck. That's the sound of your ear cells dying on this edition of Force Fed Sci-Fi. Hey guys, welcome back to the show. My name is Sean Michael Culp, and with me is... I am Chris Rupp, and today we are joined on the mic with our friend and producer... The fertile Jeremy Kesky. <laughs> Which uh, is appropriate for today, given that he's the only one of us who actually has a child. Yeah. He is doing his animalistic job. Reproducing. Yes, I... That's my sole purpose <laughs> on this planet. I'm totally kidding. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> oh so, we, yes, today we are discussing 2006's uh, now modern classic Children of Men directed by Alfonso Cuaron. And the film is set in the now not so distant future of 2027 where... Worldwide infertility paired with several disasters has humanity on the brink of extinction when a former activist finds himself the unlikely protector of a young pregnant woman, and he must deal with his former demons while giving humanity one last hope at redemption. Ooh. It sounds pretty epic when you read it like that. It's, it's very <laughs> heavy on the emotional scales. Oh, yes. This is definitely a film. Uh, probably the first of its kind that we've talked about that's been really heavy and emotional on this show. At least I can remember. Well, we talked about her a while yes. back, and that was almost the opposite of this film, yeah. where it takes the, the optimistic approach with the latter film, and it flips it on its head. With this one, it's very it's very pessimistic yeah. and very matter-of-factly. Yes. You're all doomed. <laughs> Don't even try. <laughs> Uh, so as we mentioned, uh, the Children of Men was directed by Alfonso Cuaron, who really kind of burst onto the scene with a, a Spanish film titled "Y Tu Mama Tambien," as well as uh, directing uh, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. He's also the the guy that did uh, Roma and then uh, Gravity, right? Yes. Yeah, and those are some solid flicks. I don't know if you've seen. I've seen Gravity a couple times, which it's mind boggling. Roma, I have not watched. Same. It's. It, I guess it was on Netflix for a while, but I must have missed that boat. I never saw Roma, but Gravity, I agree, it was amazing. <laughs> it's great as is. Yeah, Cuaron is is a really a pioneer of new filmmaking techniques. Every every single thing he comes out, whether it's filming Roma in black and white or the 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 camera and the, the setting of Gravity, and even in this film, which we'll talk about later. So he he really does a great job of new techniques every single time he helms a film. Oh, yeah. He's got that artistic uh, flair that um, makes really art, you know, with film. That's what film is about. Well, and Breaking also, ground. And really comes from this great school of Spanish language directors. Um, a Cuaron along with Guillermo del Toro and uh, Alejandro Gonzalez Inaritu did Birdman and The Revenant. So it, it's... Those three guys are like part of the yeah. um the the Mount Rushmore of uh, Spanish language directors. I'll uh, I'll second that. So who else is in this film or who else is included in this film? It was written by Alfonso and then it's based on the book Children of Men by PD James and it's starring well we've got Clive Owen yeah. as the main character in this film, uh Theo Farron. And he was really beginning to come on the scene at this point and um in 2006 he had just appeared in the born identity as the professor uh he had starred in king arthur and sin city and before appearing in this and there was a uh, uh, many rumors swirling for a long time that he uh could have been the next james bond uh, prior to daniel craig's casting i could see that he's definitely has that british flair or like if an english actor too bad he's too old now you know, maybe if we had Clive Owen of like 10 years ago, he could take over. Well, Clive Owen could always uh, come to the franchise as a villain. I wouldn't be opposed to that. Yeah, I was going to say he could probably take on a, another role 
within the James Bond franchise. Yeah, that would be great to get him in there. Who else we got? Oh, in this film, we also have uh, a couple more popular actors. Uh, Julianne Moore. Is yeah, she was. Uh, she plays Julian, who we've covered previously on our episode uh, talking about evolution. Yes, and then uh, the legendary Michael Caine is in this film. This might be our first Michael Caine film that's on here. Uh, excuse me, he was in the very first episode. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you oh, forgot that's right. about Inception. <laughs> Inception. His his little uh, brief. Almost cameo appearance. <laughs> well, Michael Caine seems like he finds himself in the middle of a great film or film series like every few years. Yeah. Um, I remember he was. <laughs> it, it's it's one of those if you if you aren't looking for it you'll miss it. But he's actually in Dunkirk, the film. Oh, really? He plays the okay. voice of uh like Tom Hardy's like uh, his pilot. It's like the captain of their fighter group, and his character is, you don't actually see him on screen, but he's killed very early in the film. Okay, so he's part of that Nolan. If there's a Nolan film, it's always going to have Michael Caine and then that other guy who played Scarecrow. What's uh, that? Cillian Murphy. Cillian Murphy. Every uh, Christopher Nolan film has those two. <laughs> well, we also have um, Chuetel Ejiofor as Luke, and what he... a what a name! Way to pronounce <laughs> it. <laughs> well, he's an, he was another actor who was slowly gaining traction as uh, he had just appeared in Serenity and Love Actually before being cast in this film, and he's gone on to you know be nominated for an Academy Award. He's now a part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So yeah, yeah he's he's made it big. He's hit the big time, <laughs> making that money. We've also got uh, Claire Hope Ashity as Key. She was amazing alongside Clive Owen for most of this film. We've also got Charlie Hunnam as Patrick, and this was before he was uh, in Sons of Anarchy. And I can't help but feel like this film played a big part in him being cast as the lead of that series. Oh, yeah. And then we have a young Danny Houston as Nigel, which I looked at him and I'm like, who the heck is, I know that guy. He's and another like, guy who finds himself in a great movie every single year. Yes. he's. I'm used to fat Danny Houston. So when I saw him in this, I'm like, who the hell is that guy? When was he fat? Uh, now. He's large now. He's fat now? Yeah. You sure he, you're not mixing him up with like Vincent D'Onofrio? Look at his picture, man. Look at this yeah, guy. I, I never guy. thought he was fat. He doesn't even have a neck anymore. It's just head. It's all head and gray hair. Look at this guy. He is not <laughs> fat. <laughs> but I think your definition is just very broad for fat. <laughs> Quit making but, uh, him feel bad. Uh, that's that's true. I will. I won't make Chris feel. Yeah, bad. for all we know, Danny Houston <laughs> listens to the show. Oh, sorry, Danny. I mean, you're a hell of an actor, and you looked great in this film. What happened, man? <laughs> Harsh and the mellow here. <laughs> Says the guy that was like, oh, Lando, you got fat. <laughs> well, Billy D. William did get fat. I stand by that comment. <laughs> All right. So, so, Sean, as you mentioned, uh, Children of Men is based on a novel from 1992 of the same name. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And, uh, yeah, this movie, so the novel is a little bit different than the film. They... Uh, did a couple of topsy turnies, flippies. In the film, I believe, instead of females not being able to reproduce, it's the males that lose their sperm count. And then things with the government, it's more of an egalitarian where everyone is apparently equal. Whereas in this film, it almost seems kind of like a dictatorship, right? Yeah, that's also called communism. Yes, where <laughs> where apparently, at least according to Wikipedia, it sounds egalitarian is more everyone's excited and nice. But as you read more and more of the novel, it's like, oh, it's like England is this group, this conclave of everyone that's brilliant and the 1% and people keep trying to get in it, but they're pushing them away. Uh, the book still keeps in tune with immigration as being a forefront of the topics, which in 92 is kind of crazy how even back then it's so much more prevalent, or at least it feels more prevalent now. I could say almost the novel is ahead of its time. Maybe. Maybe. I, I know we were briefly talking about this. I know uh, Angola was like the other like yeah. last hope of civilization <laughs> in the novel which is weird to think about although it would have been on people's minds in the mid to late 80s as that was kind of thought to be the next battleground for communism yes but yeah not yet <laughs> <laughs> we'll see well uh, something a bit of a funnier side 
I, I didn't read the book, but I was just reading a little bit about it. It includes things that we don't see in the film, obviously. Uh, one of the things is people treat animals like babies. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's I did. Right. I did see that. They're like pushing them around <laughs> in carriages and uh, dressing them up in baby clothes. And they even get them baptized. That is nuts. Like what were I mean? Well, you know, people with their dogs. And There's cats. whole Instagram pages that are dedicated to that. So that's not too far out of the realm of reality. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. And in the book, they're like exploiting. They're like luring. They lure the foreign workers into the country and then they exploit them. And then once they hit 60, they kill them. Or they like get rid of them. Yeah, the, so <laughs> the elderly are kind of viewed more as a, a hindrance than anything else. Right. What kind of society is that? Like once you hit 60, it's it. It's all downhill from there. You either commit suicide or you just get cast out. There's no elderly care. Nothing. Well, this is the problem, too, of medical advancement that, you know, how do you deal with an aging population? This is something that we've never addressed really because people once they hit 65 and until like 1980 they just died it's like well i guess it's all the smoking and drinking that's just caught up to me (laughs) oh my god and then i think the last one thing that was kind of i i didn't hear about it in the film but they have pornography centers where people go and uh get off (laughs) so they can test how uh uh fertile you are if you're fertile that's that's something man wow what a what a what a place. Yeah, that's that's like a Brave New World 1984 <laughs> vibes. It's the English, man. They're, they're something. Yeah, how is it the English always have the most messed up takes on the future? <laughs> right? They call it pornography centers. We call it like adult film yeah, like, stores. Yeah, I mean, England, do we? Do you need like some counseling? Are you all having messed up <laughs> dreams? I mean, because I, I mean, I ju- we've just listed off three examples of how the futures are messed up over there. Maybe they just reached a point where they're like, something, we have to find someone. Someone's got to be fertile. Come, come. We'll get any type of person in the world. They'll come here. Although I did read up, and I do find this interesting, that uh, uh, Quaron actually made it a point not to read the original novel. He only read uh, the cliff notes on it. And there was only one other screenwriter who actually read the novel. Well, that's good. Because sometimes when it's based on a story, you almost feel like they cherry pick. And whenever you have people that read the book and then watch the film and it's like shot for shot, the book always surpasses the movie, right? But since this is loosely, you could almost say loosely based, it really helped because you're not comparing and contrasting too much, despite us saying the differences, but it really gives the director his own spin on it or their own spin on it, you know, their own flair. And makes a nice original piece. Yeah. So the some of the other major differences is uh, Julian's character. Ju- uh, Julian is the pregnant one in the book. I don't know if we mentioned that yet. No. Um, and then in the, I believe in the end in the book, uh, Theo survives. Oh wow! So, hey, <laughs> spoilers! Hey. <laughs> <laughs> spoilers! He dies. Yes, in the movie he dies. Yeah, because it's not a Hollywood ending, which that his death always like made me sad it's kind of like jack and the titanic even though the movies are nothing alike but you're just like man come on yeah well rose could have you know moved her fat butt over and (laughs) give jack some room on that door whereas in this the uh the evil villain guy shot him even though he didn't have to because he was going to die anyways right right well it's interesting too um how everybody surrounding the baby just dies yeah Everyone. Everyone. There's so many people who die trying to protect this baby. It's ridiculous. It's like almost a horror film, but and done in such a much more interesting way. Speaking of babies, <laughs> you know who's important? So at the beginning of this film, baby Diego. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so the it, freaking guy. Yeah, so as that wanker. The wanker. So as Chris pointed out, um, in your synopsis and everything, and as we've been talking about, the you know population is done. They're down to the youngest. The people haven't reproduced for almost, I think, twenty years. Baby Diego is the youngest person on the planet. Yeah, at eight, they were very specific about his age. I remember that it was eighteen years, four months, f- uh, like five, three five. weeks, and five days, or sixteen minutes, or something. Exactly. <laughs> it's, it was it's so specific. They had a countdown, and it's like imagine. 
a reality TV show following your life, like if the Kardashians, but for the rest of your life, you're the youngest, so people are following you around. So this guy gets stabbed. He gets freaking murdered, cold cut on the TV because he wouldn't give this guy a autograph. And so the everyone's mourning. It's so sad. Except Theo. Except Theo, yeah. It's like he's just trying to get coffee and everyone's staring at the TV like, <gasps> ah! and Theo's just like, excuse me. <laughs> Black would, coffee, please. This would be like if one of the Kardashians died and any of us here would just go about their day like nothing, like, I don't care. <laughs> oh, no, not Kim. And Theo, I mean, like, he takes advantage of the situation and leaves. But if that were me and I would be seeing all these people at my day job just looking at their computers about the death of one of the Kardashians, I would just walk up to my boss and be like, I can't handle it with these people. I'm going to go. <laughs> right. I think that was a great setup for Theo's character, though. Well, he doesn't him. initially start off as a likable person. No. I mean, even that scene, granted, that opening scene where, it, unfortunately, it ends in the bombing there. I mean, he takes his black coffee and he goes and pours booze in it. <laughs> He's an alky. And then he tries to get out of work. For, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> the death of baby of Diego has affected me more than I thought. And if his boss had like any sense about him, he would, he would just look at him and be like, yeah, right. Get back to work. <laughs> but it shows how stupid the culture is. Or this kid, this kid doesn't seem like a good person. Baby Diego, he seems like an like a douche canoe. Well, you got to imagine what that's like. I mean, you're carrying the mantle uh, that you don't even want. No, you were just born, <laughs> and you didn't have a choice. It's like when <laughs> quarterbacks get drafted in the NFL and they're anointed as the saviors of the franchise, and then they turn out to be busts. Like it's it's a title you don't want. Yeah. Poor guy. <laughs> but he died. So, oh well. I, I think, though, what's great about Baby Diego and, like, the beginning of that scene of the film is it really paints the picture of, like, how the style of filming is. I think you said something the world feels lived in. It very it Right away, it drops us into the world. I mean, it opens in that cafe, everyone's staring at the TV screen, and then it our, our vision of this world is cut off when the bomb goes off and all those people are killed in the cafe and then there's that great quick shot of the woman holding her arm just wailing and screaming and right away we we're, we know we're in for something far more drastic and different than we've seen absolutely super gritty super realistic it's it's bleak man <laughs> the future does not look exciting in this uh in England, at least, in 2027. Well, I guess uh, Quaron actually wanted the, the production to film in London's East End as he considered it, quote, a place without glamour. That's it. See, I was thinking about that while watching it. I'm like, I wonder how much of this is sets, CGI, or how much of it is truly poverty. Because a lot of the area, even when he's on the bus or the train, just passing by these homeless people it's it's so sad it's heart-wrenching and disgusting i think the most cgi in the film is used for the the fake baby okay there was even one scene where uh he used uh, there was a bombing in london actually in real life and oh. then he used that as one of the sets oh that's nuts just before they cleaned it up and everything that's crazy. Yeah, that bombing, that opening bombing scene was actually filmed a month and a half after the London terrorist bombing in, uh, I think, in 2004. Holy crap. That's, wow. Talk about realism. <laughs> and he, he he had his finger on the pulse of British society and culture at the time because he, he stayed in the UK and wrote the film while he was working on the, the Harry Potter film he directed. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, that's the way to do it. If you're going to write something like this, get a good uh, taste of the culture. It's it's very, it's very much in the style of, you know, filmmaking now. I mean, even look at a writer like, Mark Bowl, who write who wrote um, the Hurt Locker and Zero Dark Thirty, he he was a combat journalist. Oh, that's crazy! Yeah, he spent time in Afghanistan and uh, in uh, Iraq and and knew that culture. I mean, a lot of people kind of view the Hurt Locker as this trumped up view of what the military life is like over there, but it's still it's. I mean, he still got that experience and he still drew from that. And so, with this film, how did you feel about their like portrayal of society, government, and everything. It, it's I, I'd be interested to see like what happened to the monarchy, All right? Because they're not really mentioned at any point. We don't get much of a 
any sort of government view with the exception of Nigel, Theo's cousin. The queen is finally dead. <laughs> <laughs> She's finally gone. Somehow, the whole royal family's gone. Yeah, I'm inclined to think that it was like a, a Romanov family type situation where they dragged him out and shot him in the street. <laughs> Gosh. Yeah, there's really, it's just Nigel. He's the man, and he seems like he's a wealthy guy. Like he has the uh, the statue, the David or whatever, with the leaf on it over his... Uh, Sausage. His ding dong. <laughs> He's a man that can really do no, like he has everything. And you're just watching it like, holy crap. I loved in the film the portrayal of while he's in the car, Theo's getting a taxi to his cousins. And you see homeless people, you see religious people repenting to God. And then slowly it's like layers being peeled back as he gets closer to the finer areas where there's rich people. They're having like. They're driving through the park, and it's all these rich people in dresses and suits. And we do see actually that um, that motif from the novel of like treating, you know, the like zoo animals as pets. I don't know if you caught this, but I, a, there was a zebra being uh, dragged around like it was a freaking dog. Oh my god! Peacocks everywhere, <laughs> and, and and this was like that 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 painting was it Saturday in the park mm -hmm. and with just, the monkey. Yeah, they were just freaking zoo animals all over the place. I, I absolutely despise that scene. It's just this, it's this world of us and it's them. very clearly haves and have nots. And even Theo, I mean, granted, yeah, he his life is very modest, but you can tell he's wanting for more. It, it, and he's driven around, and it's just this opulence. It's this stark contrast of poverty and wealth that just it bothers me so much. <laughs> even in a film that's that that came out years ago. Yeah, that's okay. So this another big part of this film is immigration. And a lot of people nowadays look back at this film and came out in 06, was filmed around 05, 04. And immigration at the time, at least from my memory's sake, wasn't as huge as it is like in the United States at least, or even over in Europe with Syria. So a lot of people say this film was ahead of its time. How did you feel about the immigration explored in this film and the you know, contrast to today and et cetera. It very much explores this us versus them mentality behind it. And it's it's painted in this way of, I think Jasper said it best when he said these people are coming from terrible situations from their own countries. Maybe they, Maybe their country doesn't even exist anymore and they're trying to find some solace and comfort and England is just touting itself the whole time is like every country in the world is fallen except Britain. <laughs> well, it's like, well, you're kicking people out who want to come and stay and be a citizen. You can't really hold yourself up as this last bastion of civilization if you don't want people coming to you. We're so great for the right price. <laughs> if you can afford it. Yeah, we're us. so great. Don't come here. <laughs> yeah. And they, they just it's put like having the... a It's like having a Disney World that no one can get into. Right? <laughs> Except the, the billionaires. It's like, hey, look, we built this great Star Wars park and, Adve and Avengers park. You can't come here, though. <laughs> you can't even get through the parking lot. Uh, and, that's, and they corral. It's like, it's like the haves, haves not. Everyone else is a Fuji, I think, yeah. a refugee, which is abbreviated. And they're just corralled into these horrible towns that are just disgusting. Their the cages are disgusting. <sighs> Even when they're they're in the apartment building and rounding them out and and uh, rolling up the homeless camps and even um, Bexhill, it was it just reeked of these the the ghettos that the Nazis mm -hmm. set up in World War Two. Yeah, it's so sad. <laughs> this film that's what makes this mo this movie so moving. I think really pulls at the heartstrings with its brutal reality. And the immigrants in the film, they are, I think they are the moral betters of the citizens in the film. Yeah, they're the only ones that help our heroes throughout. Whereas, like, these, everyone in England is just like, piss off. Even Key, I mean, she's, I mean, grant, she, she's obviously pregnant. And just the idea of a refugee, an illegal immigrant, quote unquote, is carrying the last hope of humanity. It's a thought of that immigrants can be great. They are, I mean, there's, I mean, not saying like, oh, like they can aspire to be great. Like for all we know, they're already great. Exactly. 
And I think that's what that's a good stance that this movie took where it doesn't beat you over the head like a Hollywood film where it's like, love these people. It's it's very subtle, but you watch it, you fall in love with the characters and in it when you think about it later in reflection or on a podcast, you're like, yeah, you know what? Heck yeah, I, I'm down for that. And it's just this weird mix of events and disasters that have led us to this point in 2027. And in that opening newsreel, we see... I think it's implied that some type of nuclear disaster happened in New York, uh, earthquakes, floods, mass hysteria, all that, f- all that stuff was just perpetrated all over the world. Mm-hmm. And I, personally, I don't know how it would happen, but <laughs> uh, yeah, right. I don't know how the USA could be taken out like that. That's crazy. I mean, granted, nowadays, I mean, it's like, wow. it's like dark times everywhere. I mean, the entire <laughs> continent of Australia is on fire. That is true. And if you are, if we do have listeners in Australia, we just want you to know we are with you. We support you. Hope you're all safe. <laughs> oh, so nice. So nice. Chris is sending his thoughts and prayers. See, well, well when you see a, a you know all the people who are displaced and all the, the, the poor baby koalas and wallabies that are, you know, injured because of, you know, some jackass has to set a fire. <laughs> no, yeah, I, I completely agree with you. I'm just... We're just joking. With just you. joking. Poking fun. <laughs> Don't make fun of my sympathy. It's rare. So, the baby. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we 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 talked about the immigrants helping um, the the main characters the most, and and Chris, I think you pointed out before we uh, started recording, um, Marika, right? Is her name? Yeah, she's uh, our the the contact for Theo and Key inside Bexhill. And she takes them to the room where he uh, eventually delivers her baby, mm-hmm. and she is, I mean, she's great. <laughs> yeah, she she doesn't speak a lick of English. No, and doesn't even know what the hell they're saying. But somehow they cross the language barrier, and she literally becomes the ace that saves them. Yeah, she and the immigrants do more to help the baby than anyone else in the film. Even the elderly, I guess, uh, Russian couple who uh, takes the baby in and clothes it and feeds it, and they. They're just playing with it. They're so fascinated by it. Yeah. How th- we'll think of that. That you haven't seen a baby in however many years, decades, and then this first time this thing comes in front of you, it's like a new iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, but we have more fascination with technology than we do for babies. I mean, it's, it's certain people. Granted, I'm one of them. I mean, whenever I hear when somebody brings their baby to the office, or when one of my friends has a baby, I'm always like babies. People bring babies to the office. Well, I mean, if they're on maternity leave and they and they you know bring their baby, it's like, hey, meet my baby. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't know. I'm in the restaurant industry, so if my coworkers <laughs> bring a child to work, I'm gonna be worried. Yeah, but I mean, whenever you hear a baby, you're like, oh, baby. Yeah. At least I am. I am not. I <laughs> well, that's the great thing about other people's. <laughs> that's the great thing about other people's babies. You can give them back if they start crying. I guess. Yeah. The the shrieks of terror. It's like, oh, it's crying. I don't know what to do. Here you go. You guys have no idea. <laughs> no, just, no. I've seen it. I don't want to be near children. <laughs> no. Chris is like, baby. I'm like, get it away from me. So, speaking of babies. <laughs> Back to the baby in the movie. <laughs> the CGI baby. No, I haven't. Well, yeah, everybody. Do you, do you think the baby's that bad? A CGI No, baby? the CGI baby is not that bad. No. Right? I actually thought it looked pretty good. Yeah. Honestly. Same. I didn't think it was as bad as uh, Sniper, American Sniper, because that's bad. No, yeah, that is bad. That's pretty bad. Come on, Clint. You can do better. Jesus Well, Christ. it wasn't Clint Eastwood's fault. I mean, the baby didn't show up for filming, so they had no choice. Oh, the baby didn't show up yeah. for filming? That's, yeah, they, I think they, uh, they, for some reason, like the baby did like a no-call, no-show and just <laughs> didn't show up for the day of filming. It's like, I guess we're going to have to CG this. They didn't have a plan B? Yeah, well, Are you kidding? I guess they didn't have like a Cabbage Patch Kid <laughs> nearby or something. Clint couldn't just go outside and be like, hey, I'd like your baby for this movie. Would <laughs> you give Clint Eastwood your baby if he did that? If he gave me a million dollars, he Clint absolutely. Eastwood just walks up to you all squinty and go, hey, you're going to give me that baby for the, my movie, American Sniper. <laughs> I'd be like, sure, for a prize. <laughs> Anyways, back to the baby of the movie. <laughs> the baby shoots out and ends up being the uh, 
the MacGuffin, I guess, for the rest of the... Not even the MacGuffin, but everyone wants that child to utilize it for their own purpose. Everybody has sinister purposes for this this baby. baby. And nobody, with the exception of Theo, asks he what she wants to do with the baby. Uh, Luke and the fishes want to make their own decisions with the baby. I mean, it, it, it's it's all for exploitative purposes. Yeah. Julian was the only individual who wanted to use the baby to unite people, and then she was killed for it. Yeah, brutally. Mm-hmm. Right in the neck, man. What a... Ooh, that was bad. Well, then Luke was killed for because yeah. he wanted to use the baby. You know, he's pointing the rifle at Theo. He's like, we need the baby! <laughs> Even though he knew it was a no-win scenario. He kept referring to the... I liked how he kept referring to it as a guy. And then finally, Theo's like, it's a her. It's a female. It's like he, Well, he was so wrapped up in wanting to use the baby for mm-hmm. his purposes that he, it didn't even register to him that the baby could be a girl. Yeah. It almost feels like... Or a person, honestly. It just feels like he was so self-absorbed with this baby that it's going to bring whatever he wants reckoning on England. I, that was a satisfactory death, though, when he dies. I don't know. I felt like the deaths were without any sort of, like, shot at Fuda. Like, we don't revel in anybody's death here in the film, and they're all very sad and um, emotionally heavy. Boom. It's just they're gone, man. It's so brutal in reality where it's it, it encompasses the, it doesn't matter. <laughs> You're going to die, and life is still going to continue on. Even Theo, I mean, granted, it's not his baby but he has the only decent suggestion of make it public yes and no one wanted to go for that no one wants to hear it everybody assumes like oh they'll just take it and give it to a well-to-do black british woman i assume that uh if they made it public someone would the government would try to stifle or kill the kid you know because even though there is infertility they wanted to keep the status quo because the potential that a child could come about by refugees would throw off the Status quo. So that was my idea for them not wanting to make it public, at least. Yeah, I could see somebody in like a higher powerful status using it to uh, their advantage or whatever. They use their power to um, do what they want with the baby. (laughs) Yeah, but then I would not want to be the guy in the government making that decision because it involves killing a baby potentially. I'm just like, how could you live with yourself? This baby, (laughs) like, I'm just imagining what, what is the meeting? They're just passing it around the baby. Like, what is such a random thing to use? How would they use this baby? Like, hold it Simba over like the railing? (laughs) Baby! (laughs) (laughs) Ananya! Like, what? I don't know. Somebody's just. Michael Jackson, the baby? No, somebody's just standing on top of Big Ben going, baby! (laughs) But then, (laughs) Nia! It's possible! Children can be born! Right. I mean, that's <laughs> that could be what it would be used for. I mean, I it is, it's movie. 19 years of infertility that's been solved. There's a live baby. I mean, I'm not saying, like, dress it up for an infomercial or something, but just, just put it out there in the world. Like, listen, it's, like, it's okay. Like, we're coming out of the wilderness of infertility. I did like how Theo... Uh, before he dies, he shows her like how key how to rock the baby and all that. That's such a tender moment, where your just heart's like, man. There's so many tender moments between Key and Theo, mm-hmm. uh, and especially the the scene where she's giving birth. That long take there, where he's just offering encouragement to her, and you know, this is something he hasn't done in like 30 years and it, it feels like it's just you know, all coming back to him being in the delivery room with julian yeah yeah you definitely get that sense of oh he knows what he's doing he's a parent because him and julian they lost their child i think to to the flu influenza yes. so i can definitely see why he just became an alcoholic from that child how they split but you get to see it's kind of like his arc as a character you know he gets what he's fighting for and becomes a good, decent human being. Well, that's something I would never wish on anybody is having to go through the death of your child. And when Miriam has those stories of those babies who are dying in the ward and knowing that there's nothing that she can do about it and her realization that it's not just happening in Britain, but it's happening all over the world. It's such a... It's a tiny bit of insight into her character, but it's some of the best... 
it's some of the best op- exposition we get in the whole film. Mm-hmm. This film is peppered with it, with a lot of different characters. There's just so many meaningful moments where you learn so much in such of this chaotic nature. So with that being said, Christ. <laughs> literally literally christ uh theo says jesus christ throughout the film and there's a lot of references and allusions to christ i would say this is the story of christ in modern tales if people well do. yeah i mean theo and key are uh, like a, a dystopian joseph and mary yeah yeah because and in she even jokes <laughs> that uh it's like oh uh, what father <laughs> And she goes like, oh, I'm just messing with you. Uh, there's a lot of illusions. But I would say, I would say with this film, because we've seen a couple where like the spirituality, religious symbolism is shoved down our throats. I would say this is a perfect example of middle ground, baby, where it's not too in your face, but not so subtle where you're like, wait, what? You miss it. Well, and it also doesn't take the stance of condemning it or condoning it either. It's just like you said, it's very middle of the road, matter of factly. And it's it's just there. It's there's not too much to glean there, obviously. I mean, granted, people do kind of turn to religion as this sort of oh, God, why have you forsaken us kind of thing with all the people in the square. And even Theo has a comment about one of his exes, uh, you know, going off to join a religious movement. Mm-hmm. And definitely this film, it would be I think it would be hokey. If at the end, whenever when like the soldiers and it's all quiet, that beautiful moment where they're going down the stairs, if everyone started bowing down and then you hear the ha ha ha, that yeah, would be... that's that's the Lion King moment there where they're all <laughs> you know kneeling in reverence to the baby. There there are a couple soldiers who do that and start they make the cross and they get down on one knee, but it's nothing I would consider overt. It just seems very natural at that point in the film. Yes, Jeremy, you said. In the text, you shed some tears. What what scenes like really moved you? Like what was the moment? Because the stair scene when they're walking down and everyone just wants to like touch the baby and see the baby. Because there's the only time that I ever want to hear a child cry. You know, like you know, annoying crying from a kid that always causes me rage. But in the film, you know, the, eh, eh, and everyone like it's quiet. You know, because they're like, oh my god, this child. We haven't heard that noise in decades, and that that really moved me when they're going down the stairs like oh my god this is so brilliant hollywood how about you what was your tear shedding well i and chris and i were talking before uh, and he mentioned earlier this film is heavy on the emotional side um i'd say there were two big parts that got me and i don't know why it was such a surprise but towards the beginning when julian um is killed it's it's really sad because right before she's killed uh, her and Theo are laughing and playing together, and it's like, oh my gosh, they might get back together. Boom, she's dead. Really big shock, you know. And then, and then, you know, I think just in general, the ending. You know, you have the hero dying. I mean, he, I admit it. Even though I'm a man, I was tearing up. <laughs> Even the the death of Jasper is so heavy and so brutal, and he makes the ultimate sacrifice of allowing his friend and his charges time to escape. Yeah. He gives it up. But he dies in such a great way. Pull my finger. Yeah. <laughs> Pull my finger. It's I do enjoy the character of Jasper and I he's he's well formed without you know diving too much into exposition and there's the the that great shot of moving, you know, past his him and his wife's accolades and his uh his cartoon drawings and it's just it was just so sad and so beautiful to see him care for his wife like that who she's not terminate terminally ill but almost like a vegetable i would say yeah i think she was it's implied she was the victim of uh torture at the hands of mi5 the internal um the domestic secret service in britain it's just crazy that they can get away with that it's film. weird to think of the i know we talked about it earlier but the the almost detachment of the government yeah in this film, is they hand out suicide kits in the rations like it's no big deal. And yeah, they're like treating people like cattle, essentially, like almost as if they don't matter. Well, it's this idea of state-sponsored suicide. That's, <laughs> I mean, yeah, we, we we laugh about it because it's so it's ridiculous to 
almost ridiculous to even fathom that a government could get to that point. Right. And have commercials for suicide, do it your own suicide. It's just kind of, what? It's kind of weird. You yeah. know, because we don't, in our time now, we can't even have assisted suicide. You have to go to Australia. Yeah. To literally have a doctor do it for you. I mean, but but Jasper does the the mercy for his wife by giving her the the kit and then giving Theo and Miriam a key uh, enough time to escape, and then he's unfortunately killed. Yeah. But it, it also got me curious because Jasper was a political cartoonist and his wife was a photojournalist. So I mean, I mean, could this be like a time where journalism is you know outlawed or it's state controlled? Yeah, I I definitely agree. I think it is. Or at least it's so heavily controlled where it's not real. Yeah, I could see them uh at least in that aspect because they they practically hide from the world, you know. Really the only two government officials we get to know are Nigel at the beginning and then we see Sid who you know, turns around and wants to, I don't know, like sell the baby and use it for its his own purposes. Yeah, he becomes evil. Sid is, I like Sid though. He's just so crazy. Well, speaking of good things about the film, uh, why don't we talk about like some of the cin- cinematography? Yes. Absolutely. Um, there's several, I would call those long takes that are used are nothing short of revolutionary. Mm-hmm. And it's something that we're seeing throughout films now. I mean, Tarantino is using this. Granted, he's using multiple cameras, but I think since this film, it's becoming more and more prevalent in every film we see. Yeah, this film starts off with the long take with the bombing. You know, you see Theo one side, he's pouring it into his cup, the bomb, and then the camera guy switches, and it's all one take. It has a very... um, like I, I think I said like found footage style where it's like the guys following him around, but professionally shot found footage is what you said. And I think that's really what makes this film super like its own unique artsy style. Cause if it wasn't shot with those long takes, I don't know. I don't think it would revel as much to me. And the, and the take when him and Miriam and key are escaping from the farm and I was on the edge of my seat the yeah. whole time. That was, <laughs> I was like, Oh my God, just get away and run yeah. get away from the farm. Start car start. It's so great. Uh, there's so many moments throughout this film, but definitely the long takes are what really makes it great. But like I said, this is something that we're seeing in films across multiple genres. You know, we have to shout out the cinematographer Emmanuel uh, uh, Lubez- uh, Lubezki, also known as Chivo in the in the film industry. He's a very talented cinematographer. He's won several Academy Awards and has uh, definitely brought uh, a great style and look to this film. Absolutely. This is yep. This is definitely it's art, man. When it changes an industry and makes a impact. Definitely. So uh, a question I wanted to pose to you two. Um, do you feel like we're heading down this road towards uh, despair and destruction as a species? I mean, that's basically a conspiracy theorist wet dream question, you know, where they're all like, yes, it's going to happen. This is the perfect setup for it. But I mean, to get that far where it's like nuclear holocaust except for Great Britain, uh, I don't think so. I think we're becoming, maybe. I mean, I think we're becoming more of like a moral and ethical society, at least in the United States. So I can't see this yet in my time. I I definitely foresee a future where Amazon and Google control the world. (laughs) We're just like stuck in VR all day. And Disney, that's right. We just have the big corporations that are in charge of everything. I could see that more than uh, nuclear holocaust. But maybe infertility. I mean, we don't know how Wi-Fi and phones is all going to impact us in the next 60 years. So who knows? Maybe when we're old people, we'll be like, eh, I reproduced. Well, worldwide infertility is actually more prevalent than you'd think. Really? It's a thing. There's something like one in seven couples will experience infertility at some point in their relationship. Ooh. And uh, by 2025, it's estimated that 10 million couples will have trouble having a baby. Okay. Well, and what what... What's the basis behind that? Because I could see 
um, people are waiting longer now to have kids. That's one reason. Also, divorces are have been steadily increasing for a long time. So people are either waiting uh, to have children and uh, to get married and have children, or they're just not having children. Period. Yeah, you see it a lot more common now. I know a lot of my peers, I've asked that question, do you want to have kids? And they're like, eh, too expensive. I don't want to be responsible for another person's life, especially if you can't even decide what to have for breakfast. So I, I definitely agree with that motion. To quote uh, Dwight Schrute from The Office, there's too many people in this world. Yeah. I, we uh, need a new plague. I, I agree. I'm good with pets. No I, offense, Jeremy. I'm, a, I'm, I'm good with pets. I'm reading The Stand by Stephen King right now, and the first 500 pages of the the book is about this super flu that wipes out like 99% of the world's population <laughs> Not that we need anything to that extent, but it's just like, you know what? <laughs> Maybe something like that to kind of thin out the herd a bit would, might not be a bad idea. Bill Bird, the comedian, have you ever heard of him? Yes. He, like, in one of his specials, proposes the idea that he wants to just sink people that go on cruise ships because he, <laughs> he, he believes <laughs> he believes that people that goes on and takes cruises are the worst most deplorable humans ever so it's and it's you know just 3000 at a time slowly you know you just take them out and they'll solve the population crisis uh, you know maybe <laughs> not to be morbid you know not to say there's too many but you know <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'm not in no way saying that we need a one child policy, but you know, maybe. Just uh <laughs> <laughs> just loan it out there. <laughs> Cruises anyone. <laughs> All right, well speaking of far fetched things, what did you have for a lens flare, Sean? Oh man, my lens flare was the uh the all the white people with dreadlocks. I'm sorry. You but... mean the one with no? the one with dreadlocks? The white guy with that's on the evil side and then the uh, nurse lady that's like helping Key. She had dreadlocks too. And I'm just like, why are all these white people having dreadlocks? Man, I don't know. Maybe they just don't like washing their hair. That, well, look, not to say that black people own dreadlocks, but I mean, they're just, you know, they know how to use it, man. Stick to uh, perms. <laughs> Stick to perms, man. Don't try it. So that was that might have been my one thing. That character was Miriam, by the way. Ma- yeah, the, <laughs> the lady. That Miriam what? the midwife. Miriam the midwife. <laughs> it sounds like a, a Lifetime movie. Right. <laughs> well, what about you, Jeremy? You know, Sean mentioned that he liked this. I kind of found it annoying when Sid was referring to himself in the third person. <laughs> I think he did it a little too much, honestly. But It's like, we get it. You're full of yourself. <laughs> It's kind of, I don't know, just I took it as like an Al Pacino. Raw! Yes, exactly. Just makes me smile. And what about you, Chris? You know, this wasn't exactly something that bothered me too terribly, but Patrick was somebody I really did not like. And I, I like Charlie Hunnam as an actor, but there are times where I really felt like he was overacting, especially the the scene when he comes back to the farmhouse after the ambush and he's yelling and making a you know making a lot of noise i mean did he really not think that the noise was not going to wake up anybody in that house and it's hard like to pick him because he, he he's definitely a bigger part in the final uh gunfight when he you know is you know he, attacking theo like you killed me cousin but then he starts trying to shoot at theo and he ends up hitting a bunch of refugees i'm like yeah i don't like you i mean that's fair I think we've I've said Shia LaBeouf has been a lens flare in one movie, so that's good. If the character is your lens flare, man, I think that was what I Robot. Yeah, he was my. I think he was my <laughs> lens flare. So that's fine, man. <laughs> uh, did you have a red shirt, Sean? My red shirt was the after they have the baby and they're finding refugees to help them out. The dude that is with the Russian couple that gives Theo the shoes. He ends up, you think like this guy, I don't even think he says anything. He just gives him the shoes and then he's supposed to ferry them to the boat. And then he just gets brutally murdered by that guy, Charlie, whatever the hell. I call him white dreadlock guy. Yeah. And he just gets shot. It was like, wow, that, okay. (laughs) This character is just, all right, five minutes screen time, nothing. So he was was my red shirt for sure. How about you? Uh, You know, in lieu of a red shirt, I'd like to offer up a new category. That of a yellow shirt. 
or somebody who is the unsung hero of the film. And uh, in this case, my yellow shirt would be Marika. Ooh. As uh, we mentioned earlier, she uh, she does an incredible amount of work to help out Theo and Key, probably more so than anybody else in the film. But she also protects her dog and holds on to it for dear life when it looks like they're all about to be executed. And she even gives up her spot in the boat so they can make it out to the Tomorrow Project. So, And she even tries to warn them about Sid. And then she picks up that, I, I don't know what it is, but she just goes in and beats the snot out of Sid. And you hear, you hear something crack and it's like, yeah, go to town on him. That was definitely a satisfying scene. Right. Ah, blah, 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 shouting in her language. I'll kill you. She is beating him like Mike Trout in a batting cage. <laughs> Kicks his ass. What about you, Jeremy? Well, the dog was well protected, but at the very beginning of the film, we have a quick shot of a cow that's burnt and upside down. How? I think it was a, a field full of cattle that were just burned whoever wanted their steak they got it well done baby so with all of that in mind let's discuss the legacy of children of men all right so it was not what we would call a box office success at the time so against the uh, 70 million dollar budget it only grows 76 million but it was well received by critics and uh, currently holds a rating of 84 on Metacritic and 92 on Rotten Tomatoes, so pretty well in line there. Uh, wound up being nominated for three Academy Awards for Best Cinematography, Adapted Screenplay, and Film Editing, all worthy nominations, but the big winner at that year's ceremony was uh, Martin Scorsese's The Departed. But it was also nominated for several Saturn Awards. Ooh. So, uh, nominated for Best Actor and Best Director and actually won for Best Science Fiction Film. So very worthy of that honor. There's a uh, numerous top 10 lists for many major film critics. And uh, in 2017, Rolling Stone magazine named it the best sci-fi film of the 21st century which uh, clearly that article was written before anybody saw Blade Runner 2049. And I feel like it's very premature to to write said article in 2017 discussing the best sci-fi film of the 21st century so far. Yeah, that's pretty, wow. I mean, that is high praise, I, I would mean, definitely say. Well, wait until 2050 when you've had more films come out and then you can give an honest, uh, that honest honor. Yeah. Well, they didn't want to wait, Chris. Apparently not. <laughs> no, they did not. That's that's <laughs> maybe every year they'll have the best film. Up, oh, not this year, the next year. Up, oh, up oh, so far. They could just have to put an asterisk. <laughs> but so, you know, as we've talked about it and everything, this film is beloved. Everyone loves it. It's a great film all around. So, on that note, let's rate it, shall we? Ooh. So, on our unique scale in the Force Fed Sci-Fi podcast of would it watch, would watch, would own and would host a viewing party, what do you give to 2006's Children of Men, Sean? Um, host a viewing party, man. Absolutely. I would love this film. I would have it. I have it now. <laughs> I love watching it. It's a film that never gets old to me, and it just moves, you know? It changed the Hollywood landscape. It has great messages all around. It's what I honestly would consider a perfect film to me. So... I love it. Makes me laugh and cry and gives me hope for the world, Chris. <laughs> what about you, Jeremy? So there's lots of things in this movie that I do uh, like and appreciate. Uh, we've obviously touched on them. Uh, the cinematography, uh, fantastic. Uh, the, the story, the, uh, the actors, especially Michael Caine and his uh, role. Um, you know, we, we didn't say too many negative things about this film i would say there uh the one negative that i have is it was a bit slow moving to me at at least the first half of the film once the baby is born though i think it really picks up and it finishes strong um i have a, ca a, a caveat though you know as, as great as we're talking about this film and only i have that one neg negative point um I'm not somebody that wants to go back and watch a heavy emotional film too many times. So I'm 
going to have to give this a would watch, but I still think this film is great. I just don't want to be crying again. For me, I, I believe that this is a rare film that everyone should see. Regardless of how you feel about politics or world issues, this is a film about a man of decent means protecting and caring for a refugee woman who is carrying a baby. I mean, we're not even thinking about it as the hope of humanity, but she's carrying an innocent child. And it doesn't bog the, down the audience in exposition or, you know, tries to throw any dazzling special effects at it, but it's it's elegant in its moderate simplicity. And while there are many points in the film that are bummer, if you are an optimist, then the film will leave you feeling hopeful for the future. And for that reason, I'd rate this film as would host a viewing party. And I, I stand by my rating. <laughs> Not to poo-poo on Jeremy. <laughs> yeah, I guess I'm the outlier. No, no, no. It, Chris is saying that you're just so negative, no, Jeremy. <laughs> no, this is why we discuss <laughs> this, this is why we discuss these films. Art is subjective. And no, Jeremy's point is absolutely valid. It's <laughs> don't don't try to backpedal. No, it's a <laughs> Stand by what no, you say, Chris. I do stand by what I said, but no, Jerem, no one's right or wrong. This is why it's opinion. I do agree with you, Chris. Everybody should see this at least once. Yes. This is definitely one of those films that you need to see. <laughs> ah, so. So shall we pick our movie for next time? Yep. It's time. So we're going to enlist the help of our friendly random number generator AI, Major Samantha, to select from a list of 118 films. And from that list, she has selected... Beep, boop, beep, boop. Uh, number 110 is a 1965 film directed by Jean-Luc Godard. It is Alphaville. <clears throat> That's... <laughs> <laughs> What? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I think, Sean, you may have told me to put this one in the list, so. Did I? <laughs> yeah, you probably did. <laughs> and here he is. is like, oh, uh, what? Uh, uh, <laughs> hey, okay. It's a uh, film noir science fiction film. All <laughs> right. So. There we go. All right. So that'll be our movie for next time. <laughs> and if you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to Apple Podcasts and leave us a five-star review. It helps to drive us up the charts as well as help people like you find the show. We are across the spectrum of social media with Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, all at FourceFed Sci-Fi. You can check out and download episodes at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, the iHeartRadio app, or wherever you find podcasts. And go ahead and hit that subscribe button so you never miss an episode. Finally, you can check out our website, forcefedsci-fi.com for show notes and links to all of our social media so for all of us at the force fed sci-fi team we'll see you next time force fed sci-fi is written and hosted by sean culp and chris rupp website design associate producer and editing by jeremy kesky artwork designed by mike berger Theme music composed and performed by Custom Anthem.